Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about learner differences and some key concepts for you to think about while you're doing your research on this topic. So let me first tell you about applied linguistics, which is the study of, well, several things, but applied linguistics is about using our knowledge of language, linguistics, to apply it to solve real-world problems. Uh, this covers various things, but for our purposes, the main thing is to solve the real-world real world problem of teaching and learning language. I consider myself to be an applied linguist. If I tell people that I'm an applied linguist, or if I tell people I'm a linguist, these are some of the things they often say to me, right? So they'll ask, how many languages do you speak? Which is not really what linguistics means in this case. Or they'll say uh, something about, uh, don't test my grammar, as if I'm constantly judging people on how well they speak. Uh, that's not true. And they'll often say this, I'm not good at learning languages. And that's the thing I want to talk to you about today, right? Uh, good at learning languages. Is there such a thing as a good learner and a bad learner? Are there certain characteristics that we can say tend to lead to someone being a good learner or tend to being a bad learner of languages. So the study of learner differences is about that, right? What's different in learners and how, does, how do those differences contribute to their language learning potential? This could apply to any form of learning, but of course we are focused on learning of languages. Now, what you see here is a full reference to a study called Adults Language Learning Strategies in an Intensive Foreign Language Program in the United States. This is from a very reputable journal called System. I don't always put the full reference here when I talk, but I wanted to with this one to make that very important point that this is a very reputable journal and the information published in it is, tends to be very trustworthy, right? Now, what was done here is various characteristics of learners, which I'll list in a second, were compared to the learner strategies that those learners used to see how there was, how, if and how there was a relationship between the learner's characteristics and their strategies. What we are concerned with here is the list of learner differences that was used by Oxford and Ehrman teacher perception, gender, aptitude, learning styles, personality type, ego boundary, motivation, and anxiety. The reason I want to give you this list is there's something about it that seemed to be really appealing to people as a comprehensive list of what might be possible learner differences. And so it's gone on to have quite a long life on the internet and in other research but what I've noticed over time is that the list has been changed, uh, some elements removed, some modified by later writers and researchers, and there's sometimes not an entirely uh, cohesive matchup with the original list. I say that because I want to always remind you to go back to the originals when possible to see what was said in, as I said, in a reputable journal in system here by two uh, well-known researchers, see what they said in the original before you necessarily trust later copies that might not be telling you the original thing that was meant. Uh, now, I'm not going to focus on all of these learner differences here. We don't have uh, the need to do so because some of the original list here, some of these are no longer discussed with much uh, enthusiasm because it's later been decided that they're not really relevant. And some of them uh, are covered in other talks in this module. I will focus on the ones that you see here, gender, learning styles, and multiple intelligences which is related to personality type, not exactly the same, but multiple intelligence has come to be a more dominant topic for discussion when we talk about learner differences. That doesn't mean that it's a better 
way of describing this, and I'll get to that as we move along, but it is something I want to address today. There's nothing wrong with the other categories that I've crossed out here. For example, teacher perception is very important in language learning, right? Teacher perception, uh, a very well-known study shows us that, for example, with Finnish students, teachers in Sweden tend to have a perception that Finnish students are not as good as Swedish students, or at least at the time of the study, the teacher perception was that Finnish students were not very good. And in the results that we find of Finnish students in Sweden, they do poorly. Teachers in America tend to have a very high perception of Finnish students. They tend to think that they do well. And what do we find in America? Finnish students tend to do well. The, and other studies replicate this in other situations. Teachers are surveyed, asked, what do you think of students like this, whether it's where they're from, whether it's their gender, their ethnicity. If teachers ask, what do you think of students like this, the teacher's perceptions tend to correspond with the student output, with the student achievement, with what the students are given, not necessarily what they deserve. This is why anonymous marking, for example, where we don't know a student's name or any other identifying social characteristics. This is why this can be so important because it helps eliminate any of those biases. So teacher perception certainly is important, but teacher perception is not a learner difference. That's not something that is inherent to the learner. That is something that in Oxford and Ehrman study they correlated with student strategies. That's why it's on this list, but it's not something that's important to discuss at this moment. And we could say similar things about some of the other things on this list. You know, motivation is discussed in another talk and so on. I will focus on the three gender learning styles and multiple intelligences. So with gender, you can see here as it says that many people in where I'm from, many people here in England, and as it says, Western cultures in this quotation, but probably from my experience and from reading other things, we could extend that to beyond just Western cultures. The feeling is often that gender matters in terms of language learning, gender matters in terms of language proficiency. People tend to think that, as it says here, females are better at learning L2, as it says here, but really I think we can say that about L1 too, that people think that female users of language use language more proficiently, that they write, generally they write and speak better than male users of language. This is the perception. Note it says belief, widespread belief. I'm not saying this is truth. I'm saying this, she's pointing out that this is a widespread belief. Then though this interesting thing happens if I go to Google and I googled great orators. I did it and I just typed in great orators and across the top of the page a picture, pictures of great orators appear and their names. And this is the list that I found when I did this a few days ago. We saw Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Franklin Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, and continuing on with these names. What do you notice about these names of great orators? Well, uh, the list is certainly biased in favor of Americans, right? One, two, three, four, Frederick Douglass, John F. Kennedy, so mostly Americans, right? Uh, the list is certainly biased in favor of people who speak English as their primary language for most of them, or speak English as one of many languages that he spoke fluently in the case of Nelson Mandela, right? So biased in favor of Americans, bi biased in favor of American presidents. Look how many of them are American presidents. You've got Roosevelt, Reagan, Kennedy, uh, Clinton, right, uh, Lincoln, right? The list is biased in many ways. And certainly you will have noticed by now that it's biased in favor of men. You go down the list and it's not until you reach Susan B. Anthony and later Sojourner Truth that you see any women on the list. 
we would certainly say, well, there must be great orators from around the world who are not American and who are not American presidents. And of course, we could say that there are certainly, there are certainly great orators, more great orators from around the world who are not men. Women are underrepresented on the list. So what do we have here? This strange situation where people tend to stereotypically think that women are better at language and better at learning language and better at learning a second language than men. And yet when we're asked to name individual proficient users of language, the focus tends to be on men. Individual men are noted for their linguistic ability more often as we see on the list, while women generally are thought to be better language users and learners. These are all stereotypes, of course, but we can find some real data about gender as a learner difference. Gender-based language difference has been studied many times. The study I note here by van der Silk and others is a meta-analysis of various studies where they gathered up research that others had done and then they contributed their own study to that body of research to come up with the conclusion, as you see here, oh, sorry, published in, again, I want to make the point that it's important to look at the source, right? PL, PLOS1, PLOS1, stands for Public Library of Science. Public Library of Science 1 is a very well-known, reputable journal what was published there by van der Silk and others said that female learners consistently outperformed male learners in speaking and writing proficiency in Dutch as a second language. They looked at learners from various linguistic backgrounds. How did those learners perform when they learned Dutch? Compare the male learners to the female learners. And they found that consistently the female learners did better this corresponds to a lot of research that others have done and to the meta-analysis that was done at the start of this study. It's quite clear to say that females do better than males with learning language. The question, of course, for you to think about and for you to do more research on as you study this topic is to think about whether this is something essential or something social. By essential, I mean is it something that is an essence, part of the essence of being female, that you learn language and use language more proficiently, proficiently than males? Or is it something social, something you're socialized to do? This is just the nature versus nurture debate, right? Is it natural that females do better or are they nurtured to do better? Probably you can already guess at what most linguists think, uh, even thinking about what I said earlier about the Finnish students and their relative performance in Sweden versus America. If you tell people that they are good at something, they will probably be good at it. If you tell people that they are bad at something, they will probably not be so good at it. The expectations that we set as a society in the case of men and women, boys and girls using and learning language, or in the classroom with teacher effect on students, those expectations that we set have a real effect often. Not always, but often, right? For the second topic now, I would like to move on to learner styles, right? Learner style, we each may have our own preferred way of approaching well, learning generally, but of course language learning in our case. We have different ways of, as it says here, absorbing, processing, and retaining information. The one thing I want to draw to your attention here is the very well-known VARC model produced by Fleming and Mills. The VARC model, V-A-R-K, the acronym stands for visual, auditory, reading and writing, or kinesthetic, right? What type of learner are you? Are you a visual learner, an auditory learner, or so on? This is what the VARC model aims to determine, and 
the categories are, as you might guess, uh, each is said to have specific strengths and weaknesses as a learner, that visual learners like demonstrations, visual learners like charts and models, they like to see things done. On the other hand, as you might guess, because of their supposed visual acuity, any distractions may also, visual distractions may also take them away from the learning. And we can move so on through the other learner types, right? Auditory learners like to hear things. Auditory learners like to talk about things, to not just hear the teacher talk, but to hear each other talk. But similarly, they are disturbed by sounds that are not relevant to the learning task. Reading and writing, note takers, right? The, the great note takers, uh, making glossaries of terms, producing lists, paraphrasing things in their own words. But of course, that's all more time consuming than simply listening or watching, and so they need more time for their notes. And finally, kinesthetic. Kinesthetic means to do with touch, right? The, the VARC model, V-A-R-K, you can see how these line up with our senses, right? The V for visual is our eyes, the A for auditory is our ears, and so on, right? The K is touch. Kinesthetic learners want to do things. They want to try things. They want to practice things. But because of that, they tend to be passive while the teacher is talking. They tend not to react so much until it's their turn to perform, and then they can practice and try and learn that way. The VARC model, the reason I draw your attention to it, is that it's very well known. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct. We have students supposedly categorized into different learner types. Uh, but of course, learners may be, as it says here, bimodal, more than one mode of learning, right? Four modes, V-A-R-K. More than one mode of learning. In fact, they may have multiple modes that suit them. There are more complex models for learner types that have been developed since the VARC model but as in the case of Oxford and Erlman's list, I wanted to draw your attention to this because this list is so well known, so popular. It's intuitive, right? People like to break things down into short lists of between three and five. You know, the first phone numbers were four numbers because that's a, an easy number. To, four things, four categories is an easy number for humans to remember. And so VARK works, right? It, it works for us as something to remember and something that intuitively seems right because of the way it lines up with our senses. But it doesn't mean it's right just because it's popular. You can be tricked if you go and look at research on the internet that's not, or research or pseudo-research on the internet that's not very robust, that's not peer-reviewed, that doesn't appear in journals like PLOS One or System and other well-known high-quality journals, you can be tricked into thinking that something like VARC matters more than it does. You'll certainly hear a lot about it uh, if you look at teaching websites that purport to teach you how to deal with various learners with various learner differences. You'll certainly see a lot about it because it's easy to remember, but that doesn't mean it's right. More complex models have been developed uh, that probably are better than the VARC model, and you can certainly read about those while you do your research. But at least VARC reminds us that not everyone is like us, right? The learning strategies that work for me are not necessarily the learning strategies that will work for my students. So it's good in that sense. We tend to probably believe that things that work for us should similarly work for others. It's good to be reminded that they don't necessarily. But we want to do more than just grab on to the first quite simple, intuitive, seemingly intuitive model that we see. Finally, in a similar vein, I'd like to talk to you about Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, which also tends to dominate non-academic, popular discussions of learner difference. Gardner's 
sorry, Gardner. Gardner's idea was that we have intelligence in our mind is this general characteristic, right? That someone is intelligent or they aren't, or they're very intelligent or, or not so intelligent. That it's this con continuum of intelligence. Gardner reframed this by saying intelligence is not a general characteristic, that intelligence is in fact, uh, we can have different, that we should think of someone as having different elements that make up their intelligence and that you may be quite strong in some and weaker in others. The model is presented this way, where you have all these different types of intelligence and so some of these are the ones that probably you would think of as being intelligent in the classic sense of the term, right? Being good at math, being logical, being good with language, like that. You see other things on here though, like body and music and so on, that Gardner would put on his list as, you know, musical intelligence, like that, right? Uh, and so again, like with the VARC model, because this is very intuitive in terms of its presentation, uh, it is certainly positive in the way it reframes the discussion about intelligence to include those things that were probably undervalued, you know, being empathetic, being emotionally, to be able to emo understand someone's emotions and their feelings even when those are not the feelings you're experiencing at the time, that is certainly very valuable. It wasn't originally talked about as being a form of intelligence and was probably devalued for that reason. So this model is certainly good for that, right? It helps us see more about things, approve more of things that weren't necessarily thought of as so important. The problem for us as researchers in TESOL and specifically with learner difference is it probably oversimplifies things. If you look at the Amazon blurb for this book, it says Gardner's trailblazing book revolutionized the worlds of education and psychology. It did not. It revolutionized it, the world of education, for people who want to look for simple, easy answers, who want to sell services on the web. Uh, if you look at learner differences, you'll find a lot of websites that will sell you a package that you can use to categorize your learners and therefore probably, it is hoped, teach them better. And it will use things like the VARC model and like Gardner's multiple intelligences model in order to categorize your learners. It didn't revolutionize real research in psychology and real research in TESOL. Uh, the book was certainly influential, but it's controversial. You're bound to come up against it when you research this topic. You want to, have, you want to read critically while you read about this. Uh, one of the obvious criticisms is that Gardner just reframed terms, right? We, instead of talking about someone having musical ability, as we might have done in the past, he talks about them as having musical intelligence. Uh, similarly, you know, agility is reframed as body intelligence and uh, being empathetic is reframed as a socio-emotional intelligence. So he's, has he changed anything or just re re recast the terms? Uh, and there's little or no quantitative evidence for any of this. Quantitative evidence is not the only kind of evidence. I don't want to be one of those people who says we must quantify everything, but it's certainly important that we are able to do so at some point when we're making claims such as Gardner has done. Uh, there's little or no quantitative evidence presented in his book uh, to back up his claims that people are clearly distinguished as being this type or that type or these types, but not those types. Some people are good at all of the things on his list. Some are not so good at any of them, unfortunately. It's a big industry though, as I started to talk about earlier. Uh, a very interesting piece of research went through websites, went through published research, to look at things, not just the VARC model and the multiple intelligences model, 
but to look at other ways that people are trying to categorize learners in order to, well, often sell you their services. Uh, people have been variously categorized as convergers versus divergers and all of these other ones that you can pause and read if you want. I'm not going to go through them all. And continuing on through this, and in fact, Pashler and others found some 30 of these categorizations that supposedly tell you that you are either this or you're that, and therefore uh, to know more about this, buy our service or read our book, right? This is certainly something that's useful for those who want to sell their services, not so useful when you want to learn more about real differences in learners. So, what do we want to do here? Critically evaluate what we have talked about and what you'll see, read about in your own research. Learner differences may exist, but we want to think about whether their learner differences are essential or social. And we want to think about the fact that learners may have preferences. They may, ex they may say, I like to learn this way. But does that really matter? Because maybe the way that they say they like to learn is not necessarily the most effective way of learning. So how much does research into learner difference matter? Or should we be focusing on effective teaching rather than thinking too much about how people prefer to learn? It's always problematic to classify people as being fixed in any one type. You are either a V or an A. You are either musically intelligent or good at maths or what have you. Uh, a lot of this is based on what's pretty clear, as I think you'll see, neuromythologies, these myths about the brain that are not based on real knowledge from people who study the various fields to do with neuro, right, to do with the brain. And this is something very important at the practical level that's often left out of these discussions. Even if it's true that people are categorizable as V, A, R, or K, if the multiple intelligences exist, what's the teacher to do with this? Teachers with classrooms of 10, 20, 30, 40 or more students, can they necessarily accommodate all of these learning styles? Is it possible, right? You'll get lists that say, do this for these learners, do that for those learners. Is that possible, practical in any way, financially possible, possible in terms of time? Can we in fact do anything to accommodate so many learners? That's something that must be considered while you research this topic. It's fine to acknowledge learner difference in curriculum design. I'm not saying it's wrong to do so, right? It's very important to think about learner differences in your lesson planning of the individual lessons and for the overall curriculum. It's probably very motivating for students to be treated as individuals, to know that the teacher is thinking of them as someone who is different and at least trying to accommodate them. The variety of learning materials may be more engaging for learners even if they do prefer one type to have something different is better right it, to have a, something different you know to always have a song is not necessarily very engaging and it allows us thinking about learner differences certainly allows us to think about how we can understand the strengths and weaknesses of our individual students so to consider what would you do, right? Take this as a model. Uh, you're going to teach a group of adult learners about food. How can you do something to accommodate what might be the differences in your learners' preferences as you prepare your lesson? Good. Thank you very much. Bye.